All right, so today we're going to be talking about the tumor microenvironment and in particular different tumor microenvironments and different organs of the body. But first we want to introduce ourselves, so I will let Steffi take it away. Hi everyone. So as Bob and Brittany have said, my name is Steffi and I'm a senior at Cornell University studying biomedical engineering. I joined Claudia Fishbox Lab a little over two years ago where I've been doing research on breast cancer metastasis to bone. And in addition to that, I volunteer with the Cancer Resource Center, and I've volunteered for the last about a year or so. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about why I got into cancer research. So my first exposure to cancer was in elementary school when my Aunt Beth, who's pictured in the middle, was diagnosed with breast cancer. Fortunately, she beat the cancer, but I, at that time, was sort of wondering what cancer was, and I didn't really have a good concept of it, but I knew it existed. When I was in middle school, my aunt, my aunt Barbara on the top left was diagnosed with metastatic ovarian cancer. And unfortunately, she passed away shortly after from that cancer. And at this point, I really started to see the detrimental impact of cancer. But again, I didn't really know a lot about it or what it was. When I was in high school, I started to learn in biology classes what cancer was. And it was really interesting to me how it was essentially just this genetically driven growth. Um, and I also learned in high school that my dad actually had testicular cancer, cancer when he was a teenager, which only widened the impact of cancer on my life as a whole. So I knew when I came to Cornell, I really wanted to get involved in cancer research. So that's exactly what I did. And for once I graduate, I'm really hopeful to pursue an MD, PhD, continuing my studies in cancer research and also hopefully becoming a practicing oncologist one day. And as Bob has said, I'm a PhD student here at Cornell in biomedical engineering. And I think I probably had, you know, a similar experience to Steffi and unfortunately a lot of other people in that, you know, I first was introduced to cancer when I was pretty young. So when I was eight years old, my grandfather passed away from kidney cancer. And at that point, you know, I didn't know what cancer was. I knew that it wasn't contagious, but it was mysterious, scary, and deadly. And, um, you know, same thing as Safi, you know, once I got into high school and started learning what cancer was, it really fascinated me. So I went to the University of Rochester for my undergraduate degree in biomedical engineering, and it was there that I started working in research. So I actually worked on the other side of cancer. I worked on survivorship research and improving quality of life after cancer treatment. So I worked on salivary gland tissue engineering, uh, trying to develop systems to culture salivary gland cells for cell transplant. So for people who have head and neck cancers, uh, the one of the primary therapies is radiation therapy. So this works great to kill the cancer cells in this region, but unfortunately your salivary gland cells are very sensitive to any off-target radiation. So when that happens, uh, your salivary gland cells will die and you lose the ability to produce saliva. And so at that point, it's a big quality of life issue. Um, you know, these people have difficulty speaking, eating, um, increased susceptibility to oral infections, and they always have to carry around a water bottle to constantly moisten their mouth. Um, so while I was in this lab, it was my first um, experience in my career as a researcher meeting someone um, who had cancer. And they had undergone radiation therapy and had this dry mouth. And you know, interacting with them and hearing their story was really transformative. So I just wanted to you know, take a minute to thank all of you community members who share your stories with us and all of you that come to events like this today um, because these interactions are so important. So now I'm here at Cornell and I study the breast cancer microenvironment uh, here in Claudia Fishbox Lab. Great, so with that, we'll begin sharing what the tumor microenvironment is and why it's so important. So for those of you who attended Garrett Beagley's wonderful talk last year, you'll already know a little bit about the tumor microenvironment and the seed and soil hypothesis, but we'll review it for those of you who weren't here. So the seed and soil hypothesis essentially says that a cancer cell cannot become a tumor unless the soil or its surroundings allow for it to grow into a tumor. So it's just like if you put a seed in really dry soil that doesn't have any nutrients, it's never going to become a plant. But if you put it in well fertilized, moist ground, it will blossom and become a sprout. So very similarly, if we take an individual cancer cell and put it in an environment that it doesn't like, it's not gonna be able to grow and there will never be cancer. But if the conditions are just right with the appropriate proteins, sugars, and physical properties, we'll get a tumor. 
So we want to talk about how the cell's microenvironment is similar to our microenvironment. So um, if you think about everything that surrounds you, there's first your physical surroundings. So start with the chair you're sitting on right now. Is it a stiff wooden stool or is it a like a plushy comfy couch or your nice soft bed? Uh, cells sit on protein scaffolding called the extracellular matrix instead of chairs, but they can sense the stiffness and change their behavior just like you would. Next, think about the people that are surrounding you and how they impact you. Uh, your boss and your coworkers are likely going to interact with you very differently than your family and friends. In the same way, different types of cells can surround cancer cells and they interact with them differently and can work to either help or hinder a tumor's growth. Uh, other things in your environment to think about are your access to food. So is your fridge stocked or are you going to have to travel some distance to go out and move supply? In the microenvironment, cells access to nutrients depends on distance from blood vessels which carry the cellular food. Now you can think of transportation. So we could hop on TCAT to travel to the opposite side of the Ithaca, um, but cell transport is done through blood or the lymph. And in order for them to get there, they have to make their way to their bus stop and invade their way through the tissue to get to that blood vessel. Now that we've talked about some human examples, we can talk about cellular examples. So say you have a cell, it's surrounded by a lot of different cell types. It will be surrounded by different immune cells, different fat cells, potentially stem cells, as well as cells that make up your blood vessels. So these are the people that it interacts with, essentially, that are really important to its microenvironment. And then Brittany also touched on the extracellular matrix. So just to go into a little bit more depth on that, that's this, this series of proteins, sugars, any soluble factors that are making up the surroundings of the cell. Like that's essentially everything else that's around a cell. So now I want to talk about more of the physical properties of tissue. So another important factor that I touched upon earlier was stiffness. So tissues can vary widely in stiffness from very soft fat to stiff bone. However, tumors can also make tissue stiffer. For example, a breast tumor is stiffer than its surrounding tissue and this helps detection because patients can physically feel them. Um, the stiffness inside cancer cells also matters too and how they regulate that. Next, there are chemical properties. So one part of chemical properties ties back to food and cells need access to things like the blood glucose and oxygen. And they also have to be able to get rid of waste. Um, how they're able to receive and get rid of things depends on the factors within the microenvironment. And then there are also chemical signals that from other cells that direct cancer cell behavior, um, including growth or an invasion. And those are all found within their microenvironment. The next thing that's going to come into play a little bit later today is vasculature. So these blood vessels are important both in delivering critical nutrients that the cells need and also they provide a transportation method for metastasizing cancer cells. Um, tumors, they keep growing and growing and they can outgrow their blood supply, but they can also grow their own new blood vessels. So with that now that we know what the microenvironment is, we can talk about how the microenvironment is different at different sites in the body. So essentially, at every different tissue in your body, the, macro, the microenvironment is very different, which is one, what we're going to get into later today. This is really important in helping us learn to study cancer in the lab better. We have to accurately recreate these microenvironments in order to best figure out what's going on. And it's also really important for us to understand how a microenvironment is in order for us to understand how a cancer metastasizes there or what's taking it there. So that's what we're going to go over today. We'll be talking about these four microenvironments that you see here, the lung, the brain, blood, and bone. So the first microenvironment that we'll explore today is in the context of blood. So blood cancers are unique because they're not characterized by a tumor, but rather just floating cancer cells. So the main blood cancer that you hear about obviously is leukemia. Leukemia is actually the most common cancer in children, with 3,500 kids in the United States diagnosed every year. The word leukemia itself actually means white blood, and this name comes from a German doctor's description of one of the first leukemia patients, who he noticed had really white blood. And you can see in the picture too, there's a lot of white blood cells compared to red blood cells in the leukemia picture. So the reason that this happens is because too many immature white blood cells flood your your vascular system, and that's why you suddenly have a white blood phenotype. 
The other type of floating cancer is called lymphoma. It's technically not a cancer of the blood, so I won't go into detail on its microenvironment, but I did want to mention lymphoma. So a lymphoma is cancer of your lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is part of your immune system and it includes organs like your tonsils, your spleen, and your bone marrow. There's two main categories of lymphoma, Hodgkin's lymphoma and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Hodgkin's lymphoma is characterized by the presence of Reed-Sternberg cells, which you can see in the middle of the picture here. It's that really large cell with two centers. So, sorry. So those cells are derived from B cells, which are a type of immune cell. And normally a B cell would work with a T cell together, but a Reed-Sternberg cell works with an immature T cell. And so through that, it creates a lot of problems. So now that we know a little bit about blood cancers, we can talk about where blood cells come from. All of them come from your bone marrow. Your bone marrow actually creates about 200 billion new blood cells every single day. The bone marrow is inside the center of your bones. If you have a long bone, like for example, in your arm, the edges of that bone would contain red marrow and the center region would contain yellow marrow. Both of the marrows are very gelatinous and soft, actually one of the softest tissues in the body, which we don't expect from bone, but that's what bone marrow is. It's this gooey center. So the red bone marrow contains hematopoietic stem cells, which essentially is just a stem cell that will become any of your blood cell types. So red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Yellow marrow contains a different type of stem cell, and this stem cell will eventually become a fat cell. So now that we understand the role of the bone marrow, we can discuss its microenvironment. One of the defining features of the bone marrow microenvironment is platelets. And these are, they're basically little cell fragments and they're essential in all blood clotting and wound healing. In this video, we will watch an initial platelet activate and then bring other platelets to a clotting site as all platelets do when they are healthy. So you can see here, it's sending off little yellow molecule signals and it's bringing other platelets to its site and they're forming a plug into that injury to help cause blood clotting. So in addition to platelets, bone marrow also contains a variety of vascular cells, as well as a lot of capillaries and other small blood vessels to allow for oxygen exchange and to help get blood cells out to the rest of the body. There are also chemical factors in the bone marrow that promote formation of new blood vessels and make sure the capillary bed stays intact. And then I mentioned too that there's collagen in the extracellular matrix, which provides some structural support to the gelatinous tissue. All of these factors work together to allow for this process called hematopoiesis, which is essentially just the maturation process of all blood cells. Essentially, these cells need to grow up while they're still living at home in their bone marrow before they can be released to do their real world job. So that's the healthy bone marrow microenvironment. So now we can talk about its role in cancer. So leukemia is originally thought to be initiated by a genetic change. This can happen on a variety of genes, but let's say for this one, we have a mutation to a gene called HOXA9, which is a gene important to the development of red blood cells. If something is mutated in this way, it will suddenly have lots of crosstalk between itself and its surrounding environment. In the red bone marrow, this mutated cell will release cytokines. Um, you may have heard of like a cytokine storm from COVID, so they're basically just inflammatory markers. So these inflammatory markers are released and will interact with other hematopoietic stem cells, and this causes them to start dividing rapidly, which isn't good. And then once this happens, the markers are also causing cells in your blood vessels to proliferate and form new vessels. They're proliferating to maintain vessel integrity, but they're actually only helping the cancerous cells to have increased blood supply and nutrient flow. As this is all happening in the red marrow, there are also some changes in the yellow marrow. The leukemic cells will secrete a factor called IGFPB, and this travels to yellow marrow and actually causes the fat cells to become insulin resistant, which you might have heard that term in the context of diabetes, but it's the same thing happening. So the fat cells won't be able to take up sugar very well after this happens, so the leukemic cells will then take that sugar for themselves to grow. And with all of these changes in the chemistry of the microenvironment, leukemic cells can thrive. 
So at this point, the cells will be going out into the bloodstream, right? So their development has stopped because they were dividing prematurely, and all of these inflammatory signals have led them to be sent out prematurely. So because of this, they will fail to provide the typical functions that white blood cells are supposed to provide. Interestingly, though, other properties of the blood itself will change as well. Fewer platelets circulate in leukemia patients. So not only do they have a hard time clotting and completing that process that we saw in the video, but platelets would also normally contribute to killing leukemic cells. With fewer platelets, it's harder to kill off the leukemic cells so they can continue to thrive in the bloodstream microenvironment itself. So in order to better study bone marrow, scientists have come up with several different models which essentially recapitulate that gelatinous center. So like I said, there are lots of hydrogels you can use, but in this particular instance on the slide, these researchers chose alginate. Alginate is a large sugar that is derived from algae, and it will link with calcium molecules to help form the porous structures that you see pictured here. Alginate is really useful in modeling bone marrow because we're able to change the size of the pore, the stiffness of the overall hydrogel, and the amount of calcium. And all of these are helpful in modeling how healthy bone marrow differs from leukemic bone marrow chemically and physically. Researchers have been able to put leukemic stem cells onto these alginate platforms and then study their behavior and how they respond to mechanical changes. And future studies could potentially use some of those factors that we talked about earlier, like the inflammatory markers or the sugar and the fat cells, and put these with the leukemic cells to study how it all interplays together. So this model will aid our understanding of tunable extracellular matrix properties and how they impact leukemic cell growth. All right, thanks, Steffi. So now we're gonna move on to the lung. So lung cancer is actually the second most commonly diagnosed cancer in the US with a new case uh, being diagnosed every 2.3 minutes. So of the cancers that start in the lung, there are two main categories. Those are non-small cell lung cancer or the less common small cell lung cancer. So this classification is dependent on how these cells look underneath the microscope um, and it's actually their size. And it also depends on the cell type uh, within the lung that first uh, mutates or develops into this tumor. So the lung is also a site of metastasis for almost all cancers, due in part to the high blood flow through the lung to get oxygen. So uh, metastasis is going to be a tumor that starts in one organ, but then travels to another. So a metastasis in the lung would be somewhere, a cancer that had started somewhere, such as the breast or the prostate, and then those breast or prostate cells settled and traveled into the lung. So the lung, its whole function in our body is it's built for gas exchange. So it's a series of tubes or airways that carries the air you breathe into alveolar sacs, which here in the diagram look like a bunch of grapes. Um, and that's where the gas exchange actually occurs. So the important and unique feature about the lung microenvironment that sets it apart from other tissues in the body is that the lung cells are actually in contact with air. So you can see the diagram over here, you have air with, that fills that sac, um, and then you have two types of lung cells that are shown. You have these red type one or the blue type two cells. And so these lung cells, they have air on one side and then their bottom side is actually touching a blood vessel. So that's one of the unique properties of the lung that we want to try and model when we're studying this in the lab. Another unique feature of the lung is that your lungs are always moving. So you're breathing 24 seven. So on average, your lungs are expanding and contracting over 20,000 times per day. So every time you breathe in, your lungs expand and the cells get stretched. So your lung cells go through the cyclic motion of you know, being under this tensile force and then relaxing back all the time. So these forces can really change a cell's behavior. And these are, again, things that are definitely not seen in traditional cell culture platforms where cells are grown um, in a Petri dish. So what I want to show you all now and is, is an example of organ on a chip technology. So the idea behind organs on a chip is to build a mini tissue that has features of those organs um, in the body. So in here with the lung, they're gonna focus on having that air cell interface and also a breathing motion. So I'm gonna play about a minute of this video just so everyone can get a really good visualization of what it looks like. 
physical and chemical functions of a living, breathing lung. With every breath, air enters the lungs, filling and expanding microscopic air sacs. Oxygen is transferred across lung and capillary cells and into the bloodstream. This is also where aerosol drugs are absorbed and where infections and tumors form in the lung. The lung on a chip is crystal clear, flexible, and about the size of a small computer memory stick. But it contains tiny hollow channels created using microchip fabrication techniques. A porous, flexible membrane separates the two channels at the center of the device. The opposite sides of the membrane are lined by human lung and capillary blood vessel cells. This mimics the arrangement of lung and blood vessel cells in the air sac of the lung. Application of cyclic suction in side channels makes the entire flexible sheet and cells stretch and relax rhythmically, just like our lung cells do when we breathe. In the lung on a chip device, air flows over the top of the human lung cells and a liquid medium containing human white blood cells flows below the capillary cell layer. To test how well the lung on a chip device All right, so hopefully you all got a pretty good visualization of what these devices actually look like. But oops, the natural how do researchers use this technology to study lung cancer? So first we need to understand what a primary tumor or a tumor that starts in the lung looks like within the lung. So as seen here, um, and as also seen in the video, um, you're gonna have this layer of lung cells. And so the cancer cells, which here are shown in blue, they start in that layer of cells. And these lung cancer cells, it, they can grow to extend upwards into the airspace or downwards into the blood vessel, where they can then travel to other places within the lung or in other organs. So, to model this system, uh, the researchers used those devices as we saw in the video. And they took uh, non-small cell lung cancer cells and they mixed them with healthy lung cells that they got from patients. And they put the mix of tumor cells and lung cells on that top channel of the device where it's gonna touch the air. Then on that bottom layer of the device, it's seated with the blood vessel cells like we saw in the video too. Um, so with these devices, the researchers could have some that they kept still and other ones that they applied that breathing motion to, to um, mimic breathing that we see in the body. So if you're wondering um, how they separate and are able to see the cancer cells as opposed to the regular lung cells, um, the lung cancer cells were actually modified to express green fluorescent protein which means that under the microscope, the cancer cells are gonna glow green when they're exposed to a certain wavelength of light. So uh, in this study, uh, they compared first just the differences between uh, no breathing and breathing. So this study found that lung cancer cells will proliferate and invade into the blood vessel space on the chip as shown here. So this is like a top view and then the images that are on your right hand side those show invasion as a cross section down into the blood vessel. And so this was over the course of two weeks. So what they actually found was when they then had the cells, um, had these devices set to breathing, that breathing actually decreased cancer cell growth and it decreased invasion. Um, what's important to note is that when they did this on plastic, that proliferation or that growth was also very fast. So this is an interesting finding because it's showing that breathing causes slower cancer cell growth. Um, it's important to be able to study how lung cancer behaves when they're in contact with other lung cells and when they have this physiologically relevant breathing forces. One area of research where this is going to be really important and useful is in drug studies. So chemotherapies and other cancer drugs often target these rapidly dividing cancer cells. But if in the body they aren't dividing rapidly, as rapidly as they do in a dish, then those drugs might not be as effective. And that's actually something that the authors wanted to look at next was to see if these devices would let them mimic something that they had seen in patients but had not seen in previous cell culture methods. So um, in many non-small cell lung cancer patients, um, it's common for all of these tumors to have the same mutation in a growth factor receptor called EGFR. So clinically what's seen is that the tumor will respond well to this first inhibitor. Um, and this will work for maybe a year, sometimes a little bit longer, and the tumor will shrink and it'll stay small, but it won't completely disappear. Eventually these patients develop a resistance to this drug and then the tumor grows back. 
And at that point, they have to be treated with a second drug to shrink the tumor down again. And they wanted to be able to see, um, the authors wanted to see if these devices would allow them to replicate this finding of drug resistance. So this isn't seen on plastic, but it was seen when they actually added the breathing motion to the chip. So this was cool because it allowed them to see, um, you know, this drug resistance that developed in so many patients, but previously hadn't been able to be explored. And you can see here, I just added one image where you can see those green cells that are the cancer cells that they studied in these devices. So that is all about the lung. And now we'll move on to the brain. So the next microenvironment, of course, is the brain. So to give a brief overview of brain tumors, there are about 700,000 Americans currently living with a brain tumor, and around 30% of them have a cancerous brain tumor. So something that's really interesting about brain cancers is that your brain has so many different cell types, it allows for a lot of different possible cancer subtypes. So we'll just talk about a handful briefly here. So the first one is astrocytoma. That comes from cells called astrocytes, which are star-shaped cells, which are really important for supporting your central nervous system. The next type is a glioma, which is in its most dangerous form and most notorious form called a glioblastoma. These come from your glial cells, which is the category of cells that support neurons. The next tumor type, a meningioma, comes from meningothelial cells, and these cells interface between neuronal tissue and spinal fluid. The final type I'll mention is medulloblastoma. This is actually the most common type of brain cancer in children, and it comes from cerebellar stem cells, which are really important to preserve motor function and posture. Aside from all of these primary tumors, brain is also, the brain is also a really common site of metastasis. Similar to what Brittany mentioned for the lung, we can see breast cancer, prostate cancer, and so on metastasizing and spreading to the brain. So with that, we'll move on to discussing the microenvironment. There are three key features of the brain microenvironment. So I already mentioned that there are a lot of diverse cell types that all interplay with each other, but perhaps the most important cell type is the neuron, which of course is in charge of sending electrical signals throughout your body and interacts with essentially every other cell type that I was talking about previously. Then glial cells are also really essential, and because they're the main support cell, they also interact with most of the other cell types in your brain. So the extracellular matrix in the brain is a little bit different too. So it's also one of the softest tissues in the body. And because of that, it's mainly comprised of hyaluronic acid to give it just enough structure. And it also contains this type of sugar called a heparin sulfate proteoglycan, which is just important in binding and providing nutrients. So the most important aspect finally of the brain microenvironment is the blood brain barrier which regulates everything that flows through your bloodstream before it can enter your brain. You can think of the blood-brain barrier sort of like a very strict border patrol for molecules, drugs, or anything else passing through your bloodstream. Most things that travel through the blood would be really detrimental if they were received in the brain. So the blood-brain barrier is designed to only let VIP molecules through to the brain itself. We'll discuss the blood-brain barrier more in depth, but it was important to just define it before talking more about the microenvironment. So one reason that cancerous brain cells are really dangerous is because they can hijack a lot of other cell types in the brain to benefit themselves. So first of all, the brain has a really limited number of immune cells, partly due to the blood-brain barrier and partly because the brain can't really expand since it's fixed inside of your skull. It does, however, still have an immune cell type called a macrophage which is a big eater cell that just con that will consume and destroy pathogens. So brain tumors actually have their own special macrophage type. It's a tumor-associated macrophage, or a TAM. TAMs will not work with T immune cells like they're supposed to, but they will actually corrupt the T cells, fight them off, and then they will also promote creation of new blood vessels to again help the tumor grow. Tumors also corrupt a process called gliosis in your brain. Gliosis is when your brain creates new glial cells, and it generally only occurs after a head trauma because it needs to recreate what was lost. However, gliosis is also activated by metastatic cancers, and in turn, once gliosis is activated, it selects for more aggressive metastatic cancer cells, getting into this really bad loop that only promotes the cancer. 
So to discuss a few more hijacked cell types, I mentioned astrocytes before, which are the star-shaped support cells. So these don't normally form junctions with most of the cell types in the brain, but tumor cells will actually go out of their way to form junctions with astrocytes and then use the astrocytes to transmit chemical and physical signals to other parts of the brain to extend its reach and its harm. Finally, there is an identification protein known as cathepsin S. Normally, only white blood cells have cathepsin S on them, and it sort of acts as their ID across the blood-brain barrier, you know, right with that border patrol. However, some metastatic cell lines, for example, breast cancer that's met metastatic, will also take cathepsin S for itself, and it's kind of using a fake ID to cross the blood-brain barrier and get by border patrol. So that's it for the discussion on hijacked cell types in, in brain cancer, but I wanted to elaborate further on the blood-brain barrier. So you'll remember that this is the border patrol for the brain, and it's actually a really unique feature. So as you can see on the left, we have a cross-section of a normal blood vessel. This blood vessel normally has open pores in it, which allows for water and other molecules and nutrients and such to pass through. The rest of this blood vessel wall is semi-permeable, and since it is made of lipids, it lets similar molecules or other lipids pass through it. Every blood vessel in your body acts like this, except for the blood vessels in the brain. In your brain, on the right, the blood vessels lack these lenient pores. It is also further surrounded by a wall of glial cells, and the glial cells are bound together in tight junctions, letting almost nothing through. Some lipid-soluble items can still pass through the vessel wall and the glial cell, but almost nothing floats freely in. In fact, 98% of molecules cannot cross this barrier. Any immune cells, for example, with cathepsin S that could potentially pass through, have to cross through active transport ac across the glial cells and the blood vessels. So that was a healthy blood-brain barrier. So now we can talk about what happens in cancer. So as you can see in the schematic, the barrier is no longer a tightly sealed border. It's essentially as though Border Patrol has fleed their posts altogether. The glial cells are separating both from each other and the vessel walls, thus creating space through which molecules can diffuse. The vessel's pores also open up again, allowing water, molecules, immune factors, and other nutrients with it. And then especially in inflammatory immune factors like the cytokines that I mentioned before, they normally can't get through, but they can now once this happens. Finally, tumor cells will also encroach on the previously tight barrier, mechanically forcing it further apart. Interestingly, the blood-brain barrier can still block some molecules. It actually tends to still be able to block a lot of drugs, which is really unfortunate because it's only opening enough to let in small bad factors like cytokines, but it's not necessarily open wide enough to let in drugs as well. So the blood-brain barrier is pretty much the largest barrier in brain cancer research in terms of furthering treatment. So one thing that's been done has been a microchip model of the blood-brain barrier. The surface area of it is only about the size of three nickels. And as you can see, we've zoomed in on the central chamber here. And the central chamber uses electrodes pictured on the top and the bottom, as well as a flow channel for blood going through that bottom part to help mimic blood flow. These devices are really hard to model because the type of cells that are used in brain blood vessels are really hard to grow in a lab, but these researchers actually succeeded in deriving them from stem cells, and they were able to successfully implant them in the device, and then they put the layer of glial cells on top, as was pictured in the schematic. So once all of this was complete, their device actually was really close to mimicking a real-life blood-brain barrier, it let through small molecules that normally go through, such as caffeine, but it wouldn't let through almost every drug, which is pretty accurate. So now that we have this model of a healthy blood-brain barrier, we can either keep it in its current form and use it with new drugs to see if they'll get through the blood-brain barrier no matter what, or we could also change it slightly and loosen it up to better model brain cancer, blood-brain barrier um, aspects. And then from there, we could see which drugs are still able to get through or not. Essentially, this blood-brain barrier microchip is essential to screening drug characteristics and improving our treatment of brain cancers. So now we're going to talk about one last of the different microenvironments within the body, and this one is going to be the bone. 
So primary cancer, so cancers that start within the bone, cartilage, or joints are actually quite rare. So all of those together combine for only 0.2% of cancers that are diagnosed in the U.S. However, what is pretty common is metastasis of cancers to the bone. So it's a common site for breast, prostate, kidney, and lung cancers. For metastatic cancers of the breast and the prostate, so of breast and prostate cancers that have spread somewhere, about two thirds of those will have gone to the bone as opposed to other organs. So what happens in particular in some metastasis, um, is, such as in breast cancer, is that the cancer cells can actually form something called an osteolytic legion, which is where the tumor cells will break down the bone. And that's actually shown in this image over here, where it looks like there's kind of like a chunk of the bone missing on the left side of it. That's an example of these breakdown, and these are very painful to the patients that have them. So today what I want to talk about is the features of the bone that make it different from any other thing within the body. So the first feature is its stiffness. So the bone is going to be the stiffest tissue in the body, and as shown here, it's 100,000 times uh, stiffer than the brain. Um, the second thing that I want to talk about with the bone is its unique matrix composition and how that's going to impact cell behavior. Um, what I want to just say first of all is that for this part of the talk, I'm going to be talking about the hard outer parts of the bone um, at the ends and the circumference around the bone. So this is separate from that spongy, gooey marrow that Steffi talked about earlier in relation to blood cancers. So of these hard parts of, of the bone, the bone's going to be uh, comprised of collagen and mineral matrix and several cell types. So there are two main cell types that live in the bone, uh, and those are shown here. The blue cells are bone building cells called osteoblasts, and the orange cells are bone breakdown cells called osteoclast. So the bone is kind of different in that it's constantly being remodeled. So these two cell types are always working together to build bone and break down bone. The pink cell that's shown there is an example of a metastatic uh, breast cancer cell and how it will settle in there and interact with those cell types and the bone matrix. So now what I want to talk about is the importance of the unique extracellular matrix of the bone. So uh, the bone is made up of collagen and a mineral crystal called hydroxyapatite. So here the collagen fibers are shown in gray and the hydroxyapatite is shown as kind of these blue rectangles. So this mineralized matrix is unique to the bone. It's not found anywhere else in the body and that's why it's important to study. So we know that mineral does play a role. Um, you know, patients who have lower uh, mineral content in their bone, uh, there's an increased likelihood of bone metastasis from breast cancer. So we know that mineral is important and we want to be able to study it further. Oops. Okay, so basically there are two main ways that we can study and build these models of bones within our lab. So the first way to approach this is to basically build a bone from scratch. So in the lab, we can take collagen and we can take mineral and put them together to make that bone matrix. Uh, the second approach that I'm going to be talking about today is going to be you start with a really complex bone tissue and you remove all of the things that you don't want, all the different cell types and components, and you get left with the special matrix that you want to study. So this is, um, I'm going to talk about both of these methods, so building bone from scratch and starting with bone and stripping it down. And these are both methods that our lab and other labs at Cornell are actually currently working on. So in our lab, we're really focused on bone and mineral. So what we can do, this is an example of building bones from scratch. Uh, we can take collagen and we can make something called collagen hydrogels. Um, what we can also do is we can add mineral so that we can have mineralized collagen. So the top picture is going to be uh, just collagen. So those are actually collagen fibers that form like that. And the bottom picture is an example of one of these gels we can make where we add in the mineral to have mineralized collagen like we see in the bone. So what we can do now is that we can add breast cancer cells on top of these two unique different types of gels. 
So this allows us to study the cells interacting on the collagen and also the mineralized collagen. And so what we people found within our lab is that the cells on the collagen, they have a more elongated shape, so they're longer and they're more spread out. And on the mineralized collagen, like we see in the bone, we actually found that they're rounder. And so this changes how, um, we found that the mineral changes how the cells adhere or interact with the bone. And that's something important that, you know, we're working on going forwards to really study, um, you know, how cancer actually behaves in the body um, and can respond to things like drug treatments. So the other approach that I mentioned was starting with a full bone tissue and removing the parts you don't need. So this can be done through a process called decellularization. In this process, what we're gonna do is we are going to remove all of the cells, but keep the matrix that's left behind. And what's important here is it lets us to preserve the complex and unique uh, like geometrical structure of the matrix. So in this process, what people in our lab and other labs at Cornell do is they take a piece of bone from a cow femur. So they take this bone from a cow, a piece of it, and they put it into water and detergent solutions to remove all of the cells. So after that process, we are left with a mineralized matrix. Um, what we can do is we can also put it into another solution and that will remove all of the mineral. So in this way, we can keep that special structure that's only found within the bone and the composition, um, but we can have mineralized and non-mineralized versions to study. And so this is an example from another lab here at Cornell. And these are images where the mineral is going to be shown in white. So this is a bone that's just been decellularized, so you can see all of the mineral. And then on the, I mean, on, on the, the right over here, the far right, you can see one that shows in red, and that's going to be just the collagen part of the decellularized bone. So these are really cool models to study, and this is a big um, part of ongoing research that's happening at Cornell. So what we can do is we can take these decellularized models and the decellularized and demineralized version, and we can put on top of them to breast cancer cells. So we can use this to study lots of different things about the cancer. Um, one of the things that we're interested in looking at is a process called dormancy. So that's where cancer cells will travel to the bone and they essentially go into this hibernation mode for long periods of times before they wake up and start to divide again. So that's what we're doing right now. So everyone's gonna have to stay tuned and hopefully in future uh, seminars, we'll have some more results to share with you all. So now it's time to wrap everything up. So hopefully you all learned today that the microenvironment is gonna be everything surrounding cells, including other cells, the extracellular matrix, and these physical and chemical properties. Um, what we really want to emphasize is that every organ and every tissue has a very different microenvironment, and none of these look like a petri dish, none of these look like a tissue culture flask. So because of this, you know, researchers are really working towards developing new models that better can mimic these organ-specific microenvironments, especially to be able to study cancer. So that's all we have for you today. Um, thank you all of you for coming. It's great to see so many of you here. Uh, we want to especially thank the Fishbach Lab for all of their support. Um, you know, we can open it up for questions now, but if you have any other questions or feedback you want to give to us, you can email us and our email addresses are listed here. Yeah, so yeah, we can open up to questions now, but thank you all for coming. Thank you, everyone. Um, I actually received some messaged questions, so I think we'll start with those two questions. So the first question I got was please expand on chemical signals. Can chemical signals activate across the microenvironment or across different microenvironments? So the answer to that question is yes. So chemical signals, because they're just small little molecules, they're able to diffuse and travel throughout their environments. And there are a lot of chemical signals that are important in a lot of different areas in the body. So I keep coming back to cytokines since you've all probably heard of them. With COVID, cytokines exist in almost all of your organs. So a lot of different chemical signals exist all over the body and can travel throughout. And then um, the second question that I received 
was if a cancer flourishes only in its original microenvironment, how does it metastasize? So that's actually a really good question because that's something that researchers are still working towards figuring out. So we know, well, Brittany and I both mentioned how the lung, the brain, and the bone are all really common sites of metastasis. So it's something about those particular microenvironments that we think really attracts other cancer cells, but we're not totally sure. With metastasis, we know that from the original tumor, there are single cells that break off called disseminated tumor cells. They're able to enter the bloodstream, flow throughout the bloodstream, and occasionally some of them leave the bloodstream, but we don't entirely understand why specific cells do leave, why specific cells will then plant down and be able to start a metastatic lesion. So it's something that we're still working on figuring out. Um, yeah, someone commented that the fact that cancer impedes breathing in and of itself is especially diabolical, and that is definitely true. In the paper, they actually said that specifically. They said that, you know, this is evidence where there's a lot of cases where tumors in the lungs will block off airways, um, so they will expand, block off the airway, and then it can't breathe. And so this kind of creates this, like, positive feedback loop where now they're staying still and they're going to grow more, so that is exactly what happens. Um, it's a good observation, and they did mention that in the paper as an important finding. Um, okay, another one. How hard is it to change the microenvironment in real life? That is a really good question. So there are a lot of therapies today that are starting to look at how you can change the microenvironment. So something in particular that's been looked at in the past um, are anti-angiogenic therapies. So these are things where it's gonna actually inhibit new blood vessel formation within the tumor. So these are things that have been tried in the past. There's varying levels of success. Some were successful and some were not. But these were all in an effort to try and change, uh, you know, the blood vessels were there and to basically cut off those nutrient and oxygen supplies to tumors. So that's one example of how we're trying to change the microenvironment kind of in the body. Um, you know, there are other studies that are, are still going on. So, you know, looking at things at changing the signaling molecules and things, um, you know, and inhibiting growth factors and other chemical signals that would be in there and other things that are looking at, you know, basically how the cells are able to invade. Um, so that's something that it is, it is difficult, you know, to change this microenvironment, but that is where research is headed. Yeah, um, I think to just add one more thing to that, another really important thing we're trying to figure out is how the microenvironment changes before the cancer is actually developed. So then if we were able to detect that, we might be able to prevent the cancer from ever progressing to stage one, stage two, and so on. So that would be another, that also though is very difficult and something that's still being researched. Then um, the next question was, could we affect the blood-brain barrier by applying electrodes on the chip? And so that's exactly what the researchers did, actually, is they have electrodes on the top and bottom portion of the chip. And what this does is it creates something called TIR, which is uh, transendothelial electric resistance. Um, so that just that helps create resistance across the cells to better to better determine what is actually able to cross and what will actually flow. So we're essentially using electricity to help model that really tight border that I was talking about earlier. So yeah, the electrodes are a really essential component of that chip. 